All right, why don't we go ahead? We're going to pray and we'll get into Genesis 24, part three. We might finish Genesis 24 today. I didn't think we'd spend that long in, in this passage, but it's been good. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your holy word that you have spoken and you've spoken clearly. And there's so much for us to glean, to learn, to receive from your word this evening. And Lord, I pray that it would be your agenda, your time to speak to your people. I pray that you would enable each of us to not just tune it out, but to listen intently to what you have to say to us in our life. I pray that you would speak clearly, Lord. And I pray that you would just wow us with your sovereignty and your grace and your provision that you've given us in Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen. So I got some review questions for you to kind of remind us where we're at in the book of Genesis and why. As a big picture context, I find scripture does this a lot. Got a chance to uh, hang out with Trevor and Ashley over there who are getting married this year. Woo! Right? Come on. There we go. Thank you. So, and we were talking about some of the different things and how in Genesis at the beginning, Genesis chapter one is a zoomed out view, big picture of how God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter two is a zoomed in view on how God created man and woman and for what purpose. Well, scripture tends to do that a lot. Zoom out and zoom in. So if we zoom out and look at the whole book of Genesis, you remember Moses is writing to these wilderness wandering Jews, ex-slaves in Egypt. Uh, my son Luke said to me this morning, we were talking about my mission trip to the Philippines. He goes, Dad, I want to go to Egypt. Sweet. Go do it. He's like, but I only want to stay for nine days. <laughs> He's like, you're going for 11. I want to stay for nine. I'm like, you better be careful what you wish for. You might stay a lot longer. Um, but they were ex-slaves in Egypt, and now Moses is giving them a whole biblical worldview, letting them know where they came from. And Moses has taken great pains to walk them through the creation of the world, that it was God Almighty who created everything. God created man and woman in his image. And then we have the major events after creation of the fall and the flood and the Tower of Babel, which leads them to then the existence of nations and those nations that then God chooses to make one nation for himself. He pulls Abraham out of the nations and says that I will make you the father of many nations. He is the blessed one that God makes his covenant with. And these Israelites know that they came from their father Israel. But that goes back to God and then God choosing Abraham and God, Abraham being given the promised child Isaac, not Ishmael, which all the troubled nations come from at this time, but Isaac. And then from Isaac and his marriage to Rebekah, then we get Jacob and Esau, two twins who were fighting in the womb, who continue to fight outside of the womb, one being chosen by God, one not. And then from that lineage, not Esau and the Edomites, but then Jacob, who his name is changed to Israel, who then has the 12 tribes that come from him. And that's where these wilderness wandering Jews would understand, I came from this tribe that came from God's choosing of Jacob or Israel, who came through the promised child Isaac, whom God gave to father Abraham to be his promise of a chosen offspring and people all of whom the New Testament, like Moses did with the Jews in the wilderness, the New Testament brings New Testament believers to that point of seeing all of that through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then Joseph. All of that goes to point to Jesus being the offspring of Abraham and that through him, all the nations would be blessed. That's a zoomed out view, right? So now we're going to go right into that family lineage we're going to stop right at Isaac in his bachelor days and find out what happens when his bride comes to him. So a few questions about last week 
in our passage in Genesis 24, who did Abraham choose to find a wife for Isaac? Hand up, nice and loud. His main servant, the oldest, wisest, most trusted of all his servants, because this servant was carrying out Abraham's what? What do we know about? Wife. Okay, yes, he was going to find a wife for him, and this mission to find a wife was Abraham's his dying wish. We know from the first verse of Genesis 24, he is very old. Now, he was old, old. I think he died at 175. He was old. And we're at that point in his life. One last thing to happen. God gave him his son Isaac. Now Isaac needs a wife to carry on the blessings and the covenant of God. So where did the servant go to find a wife for Isaac? Where did he go? Back to his homeland. Anybody remember who lives in that homeland? Amanda? Um, no, nope. well, Ur of the Chaldeans is, yes, where they came from. But Abraham's brother. Abraham's brother, Nahor. The land of Nahor, where his family lineage is, right? That's where he ends up going. But what part of the city does he go to? Where is a good place to find a woman for his master's son? He went to the well. Why would the well be a good place to find a wife? Okay. God told him to go there. That's a good reason. But why? What, what's happening at the well right now, Amanda? Cultural duty of the woman was to go get water for all the needs of the family. So that is the place in the evening, not in the heat of the day, is when the woman goes out to get the water right? And how did the servant know that Rebecca was the right woman? Way back. He prayed to God that the woman would come and offer him a drink and then also offer the water that the camel. Yep. So he gave a very specific prayer request. It's one thing to say, God, please find a wife for my master's son. That's kind of how we pray a lot of times. What about the specific prayer? I mean, there were some very strong, very characteristic stipulations he was making. Not only would she be the one who would let down her water jar and let me drink, but she would also offer to water my camels that, as we learned, can drink up to 53 gallons of water in three minutes. And she had to water 10 camels. This woman had to be dedicated and strong. But one thing that we mentioned last week in regards to her character, we see that Rebecca was a godly young lady who was willing to serve strangers with no benefit to herself, nothing expected in return. And yet we see in scripture, most often God chooses to bless that type of person, doesn't he? The person who is generous towards other people without trying to get something in return. Now, we've all done that. You've done something nice to somebody because you think that that person has the opportunity to do something nice to you or give you something you want. I mean, how many times do kids do this? Right? They start buttering you up. You're the greatest dad ever. You little liar. What do you want? Right? They butter up. Oh, dad, can I get you a drink? Can I go get you this, get you that? Well, what are you, what's your angle, right? There was no angle to Rebecca. She was a hard worker. We know that she was a beautiful woman. So God answered that part of the deal too for him. Not a bad deal. And she was a godly woman. There's another instance where we see her godliness. We'll get to that in a moment. But who was the first family member to run out to meet the servant? Anybody? Anybody? You two need to stop. Rebecca's brother? Rebecca's brother. Anybody remember his name? Mm. Laban. Laban is the guy. He is the brother who runs out to meet her 
takes her back to Bethuel, the father. And what is their response? You know, anytime daughter is going to be dating, dad and brother or brothers is involved. You better believe Haven has her work cut out for her in the dating years. You better believe, oh, your dad's a pastor? Oh, yeah. And he has guns. And, and before you date my daughter, you have to have a date with me. And we're going to talk and we're going to hang out. And then you're going to talk to each of her brothers. And they're going to get to ask you questions and make sure that your heart and your intent is right with my little girl, right? So I will definitely be involved in how this happens. I asked Haven the other day, I said, Haven, who's the first person you're going to go on a date with? She goes, Daddy. <laughs> yes, you got it. That's how it's going to work. Um, but here, dad and brother get involved, but God had intervened in a way that they gave this response. What was Bethuel and Laban's response? Okay, it was, but there was something else before that. Yep. That's right. So Laban did all of that. And then when they met. Yep. They said, we can answer you neither good nor bad. They're like, what we think about it really doesn't matter because God has spoken. Now, here's a point to be made. They believed that God had spoken to them that Rebecca was to be Isaac's bride. Did God speak with words? He spoke with events, with the unfolding of events, that that was an expression of God's voice in the situation. So have you ever thought of God speaking to you through the events of your life? And those times when you're like, okay, that is clearly God's doing. That is God speaking through his sovereign acts and his works of providence. Providence means God is in control of all that is happening. He is overseeing it all. And he's providentially allowing these things to happen and unfold according to his will and plan. And that's what her dad and brother noticed is that God has sovereignly unfolded his plan. He has spoken through these events and we have no right to argue. But brother and mom get together and they make a special request. After the servant gives them gold and jewelry and all kinds of things, do you remember what special request the family makes of the servant? They wanted 10 days. 10 days. Just give us 10 days to say goodbye to our daughter and sister. Now, that doesn't seem like a ridiculous request, does it? Just 10 days? I mean, she's moving to the land of Canaan. This isn't like moving from Orange County to Norco, where you could still reach them in a day. This is long travel time. This is, we may never see her again. So making that request was not a big deal, necessarily. But they ask Rebecca, and what's her response? She wanted to go right away, right? And here we see an example of God calling her to marry Isaac, who is always a picture of Christ. And instead of going, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus in 10 days. What are you going to do for 10 days? I do a bunch of sin, right? Really live it up. Really give the flesh a good Last hurrah, it's, it's the whole concept between a bachelor party or a bachelorette party when in, in those relationships that don't know the Lord sometimes, where it's like, it's your last chance to hook up with somebody. Really? And that's how people enter into the marriage covenant. Having done these things that they shouldn't be doing. And, and that's the essence of what you get in this well, just 10 more days. And Rebecca's like, no, I'm going now. And she goes. And it shows her willingness to follow the Lord's will immediately, which that would characterize her as a disciple of Christ because that's exactly what the disciples did when Jesus on the seashore called out to those fishermen and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Then you go, you know what? We got our father's business. 
really good fishing business. My dad, he's built it for 40 years. But, you know, give us 10 days to put our affairs in order. Right? And no, they go immediately. There's another account in the Gospels where one person says, hey, let me go bury my father and then I'll follow you. And that example is Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. And that seems harsh, but it's really not. The guy was saying, my dad's still alive. I don't want to leave and follow you until my dad dies. So he wanted to wait and spend time with his dad until his dad died. Then he would go follow Jesus, meaning his family was above following Christ. And yet we are meant to follow Christ first, right? How we love our wife or our husband is in direct relation to our loving relationship with Christ that comes before them, before our kids, and all those things. So it's important that our relationship with the Lord is healthy, that it's primary to everything that we do, because that is what is going to fuel and bless those other relationships, is if your relationship with Christ is in its rightful place as first. And so Rebecca gave that godly response. We're going to start off in verse 58 of Genesis 24, and we're going to read to the end. So why don't you stand with me in honor of God's word? We'll do that together. Oh, man. It's funny, I was, I was going through Genesis in my head based on the four major events and the four major biographies that we see. And I'm like, man, we're at Isaac. We're going to be getting into Jacob. Then it's Joseph. Like, we're going to be done with Genesis pretty soon. And then I just looked, I'm like, oh, yeah. There's like 49, 50 chapters. So we're at the half, halfway point. Yeah. You really think we're going to be done by Christmas? I said might. Yeah, no. Don't think that's happening. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Genesis 24, verse 58. We're going to read as follows. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Did that blessing happen for Rebekah? It sure did. Verse 61, Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahiroi and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You can be seated. There is a whole lot that is not said, but implied in this entire passage. And so you have Rebekah getting on the camel and going from the land of Nahor to the promised land of Canaan. And from the very beginning, I want to remind you that Rebekah, the bride, is going to meet her bridegroom. That journey from her home to the promised land is a picture of every believer's journey of faith. It is the servant of the Lord who told you the good news and told you about the master's son that you are to be betrothed to him and be in the marriage covenant with him. And so you leave the old life and all those who you knew, everything that characterized your life, and you pack up immediately 
and you make the journey towards your destination, towards the land where the promises of God are fulfilled for you. That is a picture of you and me. When you come to faith in Christ, the servant of God, the angel, the, the messenger of God gives you the good news that the son loves you and wants you to be his, that Jesus wants you to be his own. And as he sends for you agree to go with them, that one day you might meet him face to face as the bride of Christ. Now the church in scripture is always called the bride of Christ, correct? Marriage is meant to embody that love relationship between a bride and her bridegroom, between the church and her savior. And so you and I are on this journey that one day we will behold the face of Christ. Until that time, we don't know what he looks like. We see expressions of him. We hear about him. We know him, but we have not been face to face with him. When your life is over and your journey is done and you get to the promised land of heaven, you better believe there is a man God's own son who is waiting for you, looking for you, longing for you to be there. It's not like you show up and he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you made it? <laughs> wow. My father is really gracious, right? No, it, but it's going to be that day, that moment, longing for you. And, and it's a beautiful picture. And so that journey that Rebecca is making is her journey of faith. I mean, think about the faith of Rebecca for a moment. Now, anybody moved long distances? Okay. <laughs> By choice? Yeah. Okay. Not always the most pleasant thing. And there's a lot that goes into those big moves. But once you finally get to where you're going, it's time to settle. And the thing is, is in our life and in our culture... We are on a journey, but we keep trying to settle along the way. What would have happened to Rebecca if she tried to settle in the land of Sinai? Short of the land of Canaan. And I'm sure she got tired in the journey. There were times where she's thinking, you know, this is a pretty nice place. Can't Isaac just meet me here? But she keeps journeying on. She's always moving forward. And someone had told me at the end of one of the older Disney cartoons, there's a quote from Walt Disney that says, move forward. And that's what we do as Christians. We are always moving towards that final destination, moving closer to Christ, closer to his church, and moving towards that goal of heaven with him where we are finally and fully redeemed and saved from sin, death, and everything else. But that's what we're moving forward towards. Rebecca was moving forward. She was not stopping along the way. She kept going, and she was going towards that final destination. And so we see here, they blessed her. She starts going. Verse 62 is where I'm going to pick up. Now Isaac comes into the picture. And he had returned from Beer Lahairoi and was dwelling in the Negeb. Now, that's where his dad was at the time, Abraham, in the Negev. But he had taken a trip to Beer Lahairoi. Nothing in Scripture is there by accident, right? You remember that? Moses is mentioning this location for a reason. What do we know about Beer Lahairoi? It's not the newest microbrew. Um, it is a destination, but it has to do with a drink. Beer Lahairoi is a very important place to Hagar. Genesis 16, turn there with me. This is a little biblical investigation we're taking here. This is how I had to do it in preparation, and this is what we'll do together. Is we'll look at Genesis 16. After Hagar ran away from Sarai, Abraham's wife, Hagar was the servant. She had already, here, ch -ch -ch. we're going to pick up at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness. 
the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. This is fascinating because this place where she's at, she ends up naming it Bir Lahairoi. And it has a very specific meaning to what God did in her life right now. But what's fascinating about it is that is the place that God showed his love and provision for Hagar, Isaac's stepmom, and his brother's mom. Ishmael, who was cut off from the family inheritance, not the promised child. And yet Isaac is the one who is going to this location that was so significant to his brother and his brother's mom. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So that was the prophecy of Ishmael. But look at this verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing for she said, truly here. I have seen him who looks after me. That place means that God is the one who sees you. Isaac had just experienced the death of his mom. He was at a low point. And if he needed to know anything, he needed to know that the God of his father Abraham sees him in his affliction right now. Not only that, he knows his dad is dying. So he lost his mom and now his dad is going to die. He still doesn't have a bride. He knows his father's servant is on that mission and he is trusting that God will see him and look after him. Because that's what God did for Hagar. And maybe Isaac was thinking, if God looked after Hagar, if God took care of her and provided for her, then surely God is going to provide for me. God is going to provide me a wife to then have children with, to love and care for her and them. And God will carry on his covenant blessings to my family for the sake of my father Abraham. And that is why I believe he was at this well of water called the Lord who sees me. And that's where he was. And later in Genesis 25, 1, the same place comes up again. After Abraham dies, look at Genesis 25, verse 1. By the way, I just gave that away. Abraham dies. In case you didn't know. Genesis 25, verse 1. This same location comes up again. Not verse 1. Hold on. Where is it at? It's not 1. It is... It was in 26. Nope. Nope. Where is it? Anybody see it? 1511? Thank you. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahairoi. That was a very important place to him, clearly, because God is the one who sees him and provides for him. So look at what Isaac was doing, how he was busying himself since he returned home. Verse 63, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening and he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold there were, were camels coming let's talk about Isaac meditating out in the field what do you picture when we talk about meditation yeah. <laughs> right eastern religions idea of meditation but what's interesting about meditation in an eastern uh, religion and mysticism, kind of Buddhist or Hindu or whatever um, worldview, is that they believe in emptying your mind of everything. It is getting to a place of nothingness, nothing in your mind, emptying it. Meditation in a biblical sense is filling your mind with God's truth. It, the psalmist says, God, I meditate on your law day and night. 
That is not a nothingness. That is not, I'm one with the universe, emptying of myself, that I might be open to what the universe has to say to me, or even what God has to say. It is, I am filling my mind. I am fixing my mind on the things of God. I am intentional about what I'm thinking about that it is the Lord God Almighty that I'm meeting with. That is biblical meditation. It is a deep sense of prayer and devotion and focus upon the things of God. Kind of makes prayer a little more meaningful, doesn't it? Instead of just emptiness. So if you want to meditate like Eastern religion, enjoy emptiness. It's like eating a rice cake. No substance, right? But meditating in a biblical sense is like double, double meaty. You're actually getting fed. I'm sure there's better nutritional choices I could have used, but um, I'm a big fan of an in and out burger. Not the fries, though. Not the fries. Everybody's like, oh, the fries are so good. No, they're not. They're, they're hit or miss. And they have about a two-minute window of good. If you wait two minutes, they're cardboard. But those first two minutes, they're, they're good. So that's a good takeaway for tonight. I think we should pray on that point. Um, not yet. But basically, look at this. He's meditating out in the field toward evening. As he's finishing, he lifts up his eyes. What do you think he was meditating about? A wife, right? And it's been an extended amount of time. And he lifts up his eyes and dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Here comes the bride. How does he know? There's a whole train of camels coming. That was the Lincoln Continental of limos back in the day. You see a whole caravan of camels coming, you're like, I bet you there's a hot woman riding one of those camels right now. So he's excited. So here he is, and I don't know if he was doing the whole, like checking his breath and, you know, straightening himself out. And I don't know how he was walking, but apparently he had a bit of a swag to his walk because look at what Rebecca says. She lifts up her eyes and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. Her heart's getting, she's starting to beat. She is meeting her future husband. This isn't like, hey, they're going to date for a while. This is it. This is, hey, agreement's been made. The servant has picked the bride. And Isaac, talk about trusting the Lord. I, I, he sure must have liked this servant. Because if this servant didn't like him, you can imagine the type of woman he could have came back with. And so she then veils herself. She took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. So he's reporting back. Remember, he's under Isaac's authority. Isaac is going to be the head of the family. And so he's reporting back to Isaac. And this is the most important thing the servant had ever done, is to go get a wife for his master's son and a woman that this servant would have to serve. So he had a vested interest in picking a good one as well. But notice, Rebecca veils her face. Could it be that Rebecca wanted Isaac to choose her without seeing her. To love her for who the servant knew her to be and picked her to be and what God had put together rather than her beauty because she was very beautiful, Scripture says. Maybe she was testing his integrity. Is he a man who keeps his word? Is he a man who will keep the covenant that God has made for him? And so, she's veiled. Talk about a surprise. Can you imagine that moment? Isaac's like, oh, Lord, please. <laughs> oh, like, what a moment. Can you imagine the tension, right? And we're not let into that very private moment for good reason. Scripture says the marriage bed is holy and to be undefiled, that you don't welcome other people into your marriage bed and room. What happens there is between a husband and his wife 
and that covenant of marriage. And you see here that look at what happens. The servant reports back, verse 67, then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. That whole taking her into the tent of his mother, that was the sign that he had accepted her as his bride. She had accepted him. And when it says that he took her, that is the biblical expression of what the Bible says, knowing her or having intimate relations with her. And that was the sign that she had become his wife that consummation of marriage, that knowing one another, being united together physically was what sealed the deal. Now, can you see why when couples experience that intimacy before marriage, why it's inappropriate? Because in the biblical sense, it's like getting married. Because you're doing something that only should happen in the marriage covenant, right? Right? And so you can see why young people today need to understand God's guidelines for marriage and why. That that expression of knowing a person physically was what made the marriage official. And that's what happened. There wasn't a pastor or a priest that performed a ceremony in that moment, was there? It, it doesn't happen there. Not in that culture and in that time. It was... He accepted her from the servant and then they went to the tent and they consummated the marriage. It's an amazing course of events and it says she became his wife. He loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And, and we see a relationship where Isaac loves his wife, Rebecca, and she loves him. And we'll see how that plays out more. Were they perfect? Nope. But had God put them together? Yes. Is your marriage perfect if you're married? Nope. Some of you were louder than others. It is not. But is it what God has brought together? Yes. And it was interesting when we were just talking in premarital counseling about an hour ago, there was an aspect to Genesis and how God made man and how God made woman that kind of stuck out to the three of us as we were talking about it is that God made man from the dirt, from the dust, right? Or from the clay. And then he made woman from man. He made Adam go to sleep, knocked him out and uh, took a rib. And from that rib, he made woman. So man was made from the dust. Woman was made from man. And what happened is because a part was missing from Adam, there was an automatic natural longing for Adam to be reunited with his missing part. His wife was his missing part. And he longed to be united to her again. And so in the intimacy of marriage, man and woman are united again physically, spiritually, emotionally, all of that. And that's what God intended there. Now we are to be in Christ, united to him. We read in Colossians 2 last week that if we have been united in a death like his, we will surely be raised in life with him. We died with him, we will be raised with him. If we are the bride of Christ, we are to be united to him. We come from him. Christ is the one who has caused us to be alive. And so we are his missing part, his bride, that he wants us to be brought into his loving embrace for us to be with him forever. Do you see the husband wife picture of the bride and the bridegroom of the church and of Christ? One day we will go and we will meet him and it will be like that. The servant of the Lord will be taking us to go meet him. And we'll be like, who's that? You know, the one walking to meet us. It's going to be Jesus. We won't have to veil our face. We won't be ashamed of anything. Because we will be washed clean by the blood of Christ. 
we will be a pure and spotless bride washed in his blood, prepared in white garments to go and meet him and spend eternity with him. That is what we have to look forward to, folks. I think that's worth singing about. How about you? Let's stand. We're going to sing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what we have studied and talked about tonight. We thank you for your truth and your word. And we thank you, Lord, for this marriage we see of Isaac and Rebecca. We thank you, Lord, that it's a reminder that, God, you speak through the events of our life. Now, Satan can lie to us and we can misinterpret some of these events. But Lord, I pray that we would clearly hear your voice in your word and working through our lives that we might know what your will is. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our church, in our individual lives. And may we, Lord, like Rebecca, go to be with you without hesitation. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.